Hi, everyone, and a warm welcome to all of you. Thanks for joining us tonight for the last event in the Fall 2020 Design Lecture Series. I'm Helen Maria Nugent. I'm the Dean of Design at California College of the Arts in San Francisco and a faculty member in the MFA Design Programme. First, a little bit about CCA, as you can see on the screen. Uh, the Division of Design at California College of the Arts uh, hosts six undergraduate programs and three graduate programs across fashion, furniture, graphic design, illustration, industrial design, and interaction design, and an MBA in design strategy. Design at CCA is a sanctuary for those with radical curiosity, where wonder and imagination are amplified through rigor and craft. We equip makers, thinkers, and doers with the wherewithal to envision alternative futures and the creative capacity to deliver generative solutions and to inspire change. In partnership with our colleagues um, in the fine arts and architecture, um, our purpose is to make art and design that matters. Our campuses are located in Huichin and Yelamu, also known as Oakland and San Francisco, respectively on the unceded territories of the Chochenyo and Rama Yatush Ohlone peoples, who have continuously lived upon this land since time immemorial. We recognize the historic discrimination and violence inflicted upon indigenous peoples in California and the Americas, including their forced removal from ancestral lands and the deliberate and systematic destruction of their communities and culture. CCA honors indigenous peoples past, present and future here and around the world, and we wish to pay respect to our local elders. The Fall 2020 Lecture Series, as you see on the screen, uh, has been presented entirely online. Uh, hopefully you caught some of these events. Um, our eight esteemed guests are lead were leading designers, strategists, curators, and educators, addressing how they use design as a tool of empowerment to define and overcome the most pressing issues of our time. Racial inequality, environmental catastrophe, and inhumane technological change, to just name a few. Um, what you would have learned if you joined these conversations, and I hope you may uh, return and watch some of the recordings, is you might have learned about inclusive design. Tonight you're going to learn about ethical AI, practicing with integrity, sustainable fashion, community engagement, Afrofuturism, speculative fiction, and design for social, economic, and cultural change. On the screen right now is Juan Pablo Raal, who is a recent alumni of the MFA in Design program. And he was uh, commissioned to create all of the branding and the visuals for this lecture series. You can read more about his approach to the commission uh, if you go to our website and his goal of creating a decolonized expression of design and using a woven form to represent the interconnectedness of the different events this semester. And a huge thanks to all of the design division staff for helping to put this series together and working in the background, um, especially Kimberly McDonald. Thank you. Okay, a quick bit of um, how you're going to interact with us tonight. Uh, at the bottom of your screens, you'll see a Q&A feature. Uh, you can ask questions there, put your questions in that uh, Q&A slot at any point throughout the lecture. And if there's something that you really want um, us to ask Hannah, then please upvote that question and we will uh, answer those questions first. There's also going to be a chat that's open if you want to say hi. Um, but please, if you actually have a question that you want us to ask, uh, please put it in the Q&A. So could Hannah and Josh turn their videos on, please? Hi. Welcome, welcome. Um, I'm super eager to hear from you, Hannah. Many of the students in my design speculation class are working on uh, thinking about the advancements in AI and how they're going to affect our humanity. So they're really eager for your lecture tonight, like me. And it's wonderful to have you teaching with us at CCA this semester. Thank you for doing that. Um, but we also have Josh Silverman here, who is our chair of the Master of Interaction Design program, and he's our host for tonight's event. Um, so I just want to give a quick introduction to Josh, and then he's going to introduce Hannah to all of you. So uh, as I said, Josh is our current chair of the Interaction Design program. He's been creating successful relationships through and by design for over 25 years. In addition to his position at CCA, he speaks and hosts workshops globally, teaches and guest critiques nationally, and is always connecting people and communities. Uh, Josh is driven by 
patterns and decision making and exploring the shapes of teams. He's driven daily by great pairings, trusting relationships, harmonious intersectionality and long bite rides. Um, so that's why he's got such a, um, a great smile on. He's always happy. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for joining us tonight, everyone. Welcome, Josh and Hannah, and enjoy the lecture, everyone. I'm going to hand it over to you, Josh. Excellent. Thank you so much, Helen Maria. Um, welcome, everyone. It's really lovely uh, that you're all here tonight. I appreciate your making the time to learn and listen and engage. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Hannah Nagel. With experience ranging from nonprofits to startups to large enterprises, Hannah's work is connected by a commitment to using a research driven approach to solve problems for people. In her current role with Element AI, she works to identify the right problems to solve with AI and ultimately deliver AI solutions that augment human decisions while delivering positive systemic impact. I think you're going to hear about that tonight. Born in California and raised in Vancouver, Hannah firmly believes the West Coast is the best coast. Despite this, she is currently loving life in Montreal, where she is working her way through the New York Times cookie recipes and running a small vintage decor business. Please welcome Hannah. Thank you, Josh. Um, so I'll jump in and share my screen now. Um, screen share is working. Perfect. Um, so thank you, Josh, for that warm introduction. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Hannah. I'm uh, currently uh, teaching a course at CCA, Design People in Society, and I'm also a design researcher working in the artificial intelligence space. And as part of my role, I collaborate with designers and engineers and research scientists to determine what our users' needs are depending on their context and decide, what we should ha decide how we should build AI-powered products to meet those needs. So today I want to share some thoughts about how we can think about ethics in the space of AI. And I wanna suggest some questions that we can ask to ensure that the technology that we put out into the world is ethical. And I wanna get started by breaking down um, what is artificial intelligence? So I really like this breakdown from Professor John McCarthy at Stanford University. So we can understand intelligence as the computational part of the ability to achieve goals in the world. And we can understand the artificial part as the science and engineering of making intelligent machines, especially intelligent computer programs that have the ability to solve problems. So there's a couple different branches of artificial intelligence. I'm just going to give some examples here. Um, some examples are logical artificial intelligence, search, pattern recognition, and representation. And then from those branches of artificial intelligence, we have a couple applications of AI. Um, and some examples of applications of AI are natural language, heuristics classification, and computer vision. And these applications of AI are then used in a wide range of products that we use every day. So over the last couple of years, we've seen a really quick growth or proliferation um, of AI applications um, being used for everything from sending messages to wayfinding to navigating, um, voice assistance, et cetera. And this quick rise has precipitated a need for principles and frameworks that can help us to maximize benefits and minimize the harm. One thing that makes it complex um, when we're thinking about maximizing benefits and minimizing harm is that AI products are integrated into complex socio-technical systems. So the concept or the notion of a socio-technical system um, is really concerned with interdependencies. So it recognizes the interactions between people and technology um, and requires us to really take a closer look at these complex infrastructures. So on the social side of our socio-technical system, we have people, um, which is cognitive and social. Um, we have structure, which is the organization um, that they're part of. And then on our technical side, we have our physical system, which is software, hardware, facilities. Um, we have tasks or the work that they're doing. 
So when we're thinking about the ways in which AI systems or, or products are integrated into this, um, you can see that there are a lot of interdependencies and connections between all of these different parts in a really large complex system. And so trying to determine outcome or impact um, can be really challenging because there are so many variables involved in what we're looking at here. So this has led to a lot of dialogue about guiding principles that can help us to create AI systems that have that ethical impact. And a lot of the research around principles is coming from civil society and government, intergovernmental organizations and the private sector as well. So this graphic here is from Harvard's Berkman Klein Center for the Internet and Society. And this is a great overview of the 32 high profile codes of ethics um, that are out there right now. So I wanna take a closer look at what some of these principles of ethics look like. And I'm going to be looking at an example from the Convention on the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. So they've laid out five principles for AI ethics. The first one that they lay out is inclusive growth by sustainable development and well-being. And by this, they mean that stakeholders should proactively engage in responsible stewardship of trustworthy AI in the pursuit of beneficial outcomes for people and the planet. The second principle that they lay out is human-centered values and fairness. And by this, they mean that AI actors or systems or products should respect the rule of law, human rights, and democratic values throughout the AI system life cycle. And some of these values include things like freedom, dignity, autonomy, privacy, data protection, etc. The third principle that they lay out is transparency and explainability. So AI actors should commit to transparency and responsible disclosure regarding AI systems. They should provide meaningful information to foster an understanding of how AI systems work, to make stakeholders aware of their interactions with AI systems, to enable those affected by an AI system to understand the outcome, and to, make it, to enable people who are adversely affected by an AI system to challenge that outcome based on plain and easy to understand information. So a lot of this part is around um, AI explainability and explaining the outcomes of models in a way that's kind of accessible to a quote unquote regular user. The fourth kind of high level principle that they have is robustness, security, and safety. So AI systems should be robust, secure, and safe throughout their entire life cycle, um, that we should make an effort to uh, understand how it could be misused, how it could be misappropriated, and that we should take caution um, around unreasonable safety risks. The final high level principle is accountability. So AI actors should be accountable for the proper functioning of AI systems and for the respect of the above principles. So these principles are fairly high level. Um, I think there, we, a lot of us would agree with many of the principles that are laid out here. Um, but what we're seeing is that there is a gap between principles and practice. So there's a gap between what we think is um, ethical and what those points are um, and how our products really impact and kind of operate on the ground in real life situations. So let's examine that last principle of accountability and take a look at what happens um, in practice. So there have been several high profile incidents that have really highlighted the urgency of creating ethical AI systems, um, and in particular, accountable AI systems. Um, and one example is Uber's self-driving crash. So on March 18th, 2018, a self-driving Uber car struck and killed a pedestrian who was crossing with her bike in the middle of an Arizona roadway. So in these kinds of vehicles, uh, there is a human operator, what we might call a human in the loop. Um, and that person's role is to monitor the car systems. And they're supposed to take over in the event of an emergency. 
Um, in this case, the driver was distracted. Uh, they were watching, I believe, Hulu at the time. Um, and the vision system that's used by this car didn't recognize the driver in the dark. It didn't recognize it as an upcoming obstacle. And so at that point, the human operator was supposed to take over control of the system um, and prevent the car from crashing, uh, which they did not successfully do in that situation. Unfortunately, the pedestrian was killed on impact. Um, when this case went to court, there was a long discussion around who was accountable in this system. And a really interesting concept uh, that came up is this concept of a crumple zone. So the crumple zone in a car is designed to absorb the force of an impact in a crash. And there's a really great paper by Madeline Claire Ellish um, titled Moral Crumple Zones, Cautionary Tales, and Human-Robot Interaction. And in this paper, she explores um, this concept of accountability when there's distributed agency in a complex system. So who is responsible for failures or negative impacts or outcomes in a system um, as complex as an autonomous AI system? And something that I want us to kind of think about and explore today, and, and hopefully you'll walk out of this talk with some questions that you can ask, um, is when we're looking at different applications of AI um, throughout kind of the, the full cycle, so design, uh, build, deploy, um, what are some questions that we can ask at each stage to start to think about how we can really put all of those principles into practice? So ethical AI in practice, operationalizing AI ethics can help us to ensure that our principles translate into an applied setting. So these are frameworks and processes that we're going to be thinking about using um, to make sure that we can really bridge that gap. One thing that I want to pose to everyone today is that our current design approach of how might we, that's not enough to ensure ethical AI. It's not enough to ensure ethical outcomes of the systems that we're creating. And so instead, I want us to think about shifting to outcomes-based design. So instead of how might we, shifting to what happens if we. So I want to take a closer look at what are the steps involved in creating an AI model? Um, what are the kind of the tasks at each step? And what are some questions that we can think about at each step to ensure that what we're creating is ethical? And I'll also be giving some scenarios so we can see what that looks like in context. This is built on some really great work that my colleagues at Element AI have done. Um, so I'm really grateful for the, the deep research that they've done into this, and I'll be building on top of their work today. So the first stage in our flow is conceptual design. And at this point, we want to understand user needs and we're trying to translate that into technical specifications. So at this stage, some questions that we can think about are what is the goal of this AI system? What impact do we want this AI system to have? Um, and something that's really important, how are we defining fairness? Um, not just fairness in kind of a philosophical sense, um, but fairness in terms of AI, there are, I believe, six uh, statistical definitions of fairness. And when we're thinking about fairness in terms of an application, we need to decide which of those definitions we're using um, and if it's going to be appropriate given the outcome that might happen. So here's how this might look like uh, in an example. In this example, it's taken from Babylon, which is an AI-powered uh, health chatbot that is used in the UK. So what you're looking at right now, these results um, are gendered. So one is for a male uh, user and the other is for a female user. Um, they input the same uh, description of their symptoms. But what we're seeing is that for men, uh, the chatbot is recommending that a likely outcome is a heart attack. And essentially it's telling the female that, that she's just hysterical, um, that she's having some sort of panic attack, she's anxious or depressed. Um, so if we are using a model to determine potential diagnoses, will the outputs be fair? And in this case, by fair, we mean, is it going to be independent of sensitive variables which shouldn't correlate with the outcome? Next in our stage, we have model development. And at this stage, it's a really iterative process of data collection, model architecture, selection, and training. 
Um, and some things that we can think about here are around uh, privacy, anonymity, data security. So is personal data de-identified or anonymized? Have potential sources of sample bias been identified and remediated? How are socially sensitive features excluded as needed from the model? So an example of this in context um, would be looking at credit worthiness algorithms. So credit worthiness algorithms are often used by financial institutions as a way to assess if someone uh, is going to be a good applicant for credit. And when they use criteria such as grammar habits, which can sometimes be code for AAVE or other um, ethnic or racial group way of speaking, um, preferred grocery stores and friends credit scores, those can actually perpetuate systemic bias. Um, so in many countries, particularly in the United States, um, with a history of factors such as redlining, certain ethnic groups have been disproportionately excluded um, from access to financial benefits um, or tools that might help them to build wealth and credit. And when we use uh, other criteria, so non-traditional criteria, um, such as credit, grammar habits, grocery stores, um, and friends credit scores, which is essentially looking at uh, zip codes, where you live, and who you're friends with, those can really perpetuate the kind of racial bias that we're seeing built into our financial institutions. In the next stage, we have verification and validation. At this point, we want to test the AI model to assess if it meets technical specifications and user needs. So some things that we want to think about here are around kind of explainability and understandability. So our local explanations, such as how an input or features affect a result available, are explanations tailored to different users. So depending on who it is, are they going to be able to understand what the outcome is? Are we using accessible language? And does the model's performance against subgroups meet definitions for our design concepts such as outcome fairness? An example of this might be facial recognition technology. So if we're using facial recognition technology in our product, will different groups be treated fairly or equitably? Um, something that we do know about facial recognition technology is that it does have a higher error rate with people of color. Um, and that's a question that we need to ask before we kind of implement this approach into products. The fourth stage uh, is implementation and use. So at this point, we are preparing and deploying an application into a production environment, and we're integrating with other systems and getting users ready to interact with it. Um, so things that we want to think about at this stage are around kind of security of access. So is access to the AI application restricted to authorized users? Um, and connected to that might be what happens if an unauthorized user uh, accesses that data, what harm might they be able to do with it? And are there controls and rules on when users can override or ignore the application suggestions? What this might look like in context is image reconstruction. Um, so while certain points of data like images um, might be blurred out in an attempt to anonymize it, uh, it is possible to reconstruct a blurred photo um, into an unblurred portrait using just that original blurred photo and a name. And so since we do know that, we need to think about extra precautions um, in order to uh, maintain anonymity and privacy. In our last stage, we have ongoing monitoring. So at this point, we are measuring, reporting, and remediating the system performance. Uh, something that we need to think about here are if there are processes or systems to compare the model's predicted outcomes to actual outcomes. And we also want to think about processes or systems to compare training data to actual usage data. And an example of what this might look like um, in context are, again, chatbots. Um, so let's say that there is a consumer facing website and if visitors need some kind of assistance, they can either choose a human customer service agent um, or they can choose to, to interact with a chatbot. Through that process of kind of self-selection, um, the chatbot, people who uh, choose to interact with the chatbot are going to provide retraining data. And that retraining data is going to skew um, probably towards younger, more tech literate users. And this is going to cause the system to become less usable for other user segments that we have. So we need to think about how we can take that into account and kind of balance that in order to maintain a fair system. Now, I want to take a look at 
how we might apply these principles um, and processes and frameworks um, when we're looking at applying a new piece of technology into an existing uh, product. So in this use case, we're going to be looking at Ring, which is a home security and smart home company that's owned by Amazon. So they manufacture home security products that incorporate uh, outdoor motion detecting cameras, including the Ring video doorbell, um, which is what we're looking at here. And there's also an app called Neighbors, and that allows people to uh, share their captured footage um, among other people on the app. So we're going to be focusing this story in Jackson, Mississippi. On August 20th, 2020, the Jackson City Council voted four to two to preemptively ban the Jackson Police Department from using facial recognition technology. Um, this is Ward 4 Councilman Stamps. Um, he's the one who introduced the resolution. He cited privacy concerns. So he was saying that the issue isn't really just with cameras on the streets, et cetera. The issue that he has is that facial recognition technology, which is able to track people and record and document them continually, uh, that that is, can disproportionately affect uh, black and brown folk. Um, and he's asking, do we really want this technology to be utilized inside of our city? On the same day, August 20th, 2020, Ring blog put up this update. Ring does not use facial recognition technology in any of its devices or services. And the phrasing here is really important. Ring, which is owned by Amazon, will neither sell nor offer facial recognition technology to law enforcement. What they did do is to create collaborations between Ring and police forces. So this allows Ring users in Jackson, Mississippi to opt in to live stream surveillance from their Ring devices to the police's real-time crime center. So this is arguably a kind of workaround. So the police are not using surveillance technology, but they are allowing consumers um, who are you know, private consumers of this application to share their own data and then to put that data uh, into their real-time crime center. So in a situation like this, who's responsible and accountable if this results in a socially harmful impact? Um, so again, currently Ring is not using facial recognition technology. However, it's a quote unquote contemplated but unreleased feature. Um, and that if they did choose to use this technology, um, it would only be used if there was thoughtful design, including privacy, security, and user control. Um, so those are principles um, of ethical AI. Um, and I wanna take a look at what this might look like when we're thinking about putting it into practice. So thinking about kind of an outcomes-based approach, so thinking about the impact that we want to have, um, we can first take a look at what Ring's mission statement is. So again, this is from their uh, website. Um, Ring's mission statement is to make neighborhoods safer. That's the impact that they want their product to have. So what happens if we implement facial recognition technology into the Ring product? So we can use start asking some of those same questions um, and kind of think about what we do know about this space um, in order to think about whether that's going to have the intended impact. So in our conceptual design phase, what impact do we want the system to have? Um, we know we want the impact of this product to make neighborhoods safer. Um, we start to have some challenges in the model development phase. So just the concept of personal data, um, ring technology um, is capturing not just your porch um, or your front yard, but it also might be capturing your neighbors or folks on the street. Um, and so allowing people to kind of opt in or opt out um, or determine which socially sensitive features should be excluded, um, there's going to be a lot of fine points to start working through there to make sure that this is an ethical product. In our verification and validation phases, when we're looking at explainability, um, considering that 
this kind of data can be shared, you know, for example, in the neighbor app, um, and it could potentially uh, be used for kind of outcomes assessment, such as is this has this person X um, been identified as a risk or repeat offender, and will that be shared, you know, throughout the neighbors app? Uh, what kind of explainability um, is going to be available uh, for those outputs, um, and are those uh, outcomes going to are the explanations of those outcomes going to be tailored to the wide range of users who have the Ring app. Um, and the last one, really important, does the model's performance against subgroups meet definition for design concepts such as outcome fairness? Um, so again, black and brown folks um, are disproportionately affected by surveillance and over-policing. Um, this kind of technology also has a much higher error rate for black and brown folks. So when we're considering using this kind of AI technology in this product, um, what do we need to stop and consider before we move forward? Implementation and use. So is access to the AI application restricted to authorized users? Um, the concept of an authorized user here starts to be a little bit clouded. Um, people have not necessarily opted in or consented to have their data be captured by Ring. Um, and if this data is being shared by the choice of the consumer um, with various police forces, uh, this the concept starts to be a little bit blurry. Um, so another point that we need to stop and think about uh, who has access to what information and are they able to withdraw that access or understand how it's being used. And then in our last point, the ongoing monitoring, um, is there a process or system to compare the model's predicted outcomes to actual outcomes? Um, and again, this could be uh, challenging given some of the disparities between um, ethnic groups that are impacted by this kind of technology. And is there a process or system to compare training data to actual usage data? So when we're thinking about ethical AI in practice, and we're taking this approach of what happens if we, um, considering that we're moving to this outcomes-based design approach, and we're really taking a look at how AI systems are integrated into complex socio-technical systems, um, so moving away from using terms like deploy and thinking more about terms like integration or collaboration. Um, so using language to really highlight the interdependencies that we're seeing in a lot of these uh, in a lot of these spaces and thinking about what happens to the product when it's out of our control out of our kind of lab setting or office setting um, and it's starting to be impacted by all of those variables interacting together, um, you know, people, tasks, systems, structure, etc. Um, there are some approaches that we can draw for some other fields. So one approach that I found really helpful is this theory of change approach, which is drawn from the field of uh, social change. So this is an outcomes-based framework to plan and evaluate social change, um, but we can also apply it in the, the design and tech spaces. So in this approach, um, we work backwards from the planned outcome and you think about what intermediate events might lead to this outcome. And then you think about what activities um, or shifts will need to lead to those events in order to lead to the outcomes. So we're really thinking about our product or our AI system um, and how it might interact with or be impacted by um, other things in that space. And then try to use that to take a broader picture of what we need to consider step-by-step step throughout our design um, build and deploy process. And if you're looking for um, an accessible way to kind of get started with this, um, the design kit from IDEO has some really great templates. Um, so this example is from the Theory of Change workshop. Um, it's about an hour and a half long workshop if you were to do it with your team. Um, and you can use their uh, PDFs to kind of fill in that information with your team um, and think about the outcome or the impact that your system is going to have um, and the kinds of shifts or events that you need to contribute to with your product in order to bridge that gap between the principles, um, the ethical principles and what actually happens um, on the ground when we put it into practice. So that's all for my talk today on simple ethics for complex technology. And thank you for listening. 
That was amazing, Hannah. Thank you very much for uh, the robust view um, of your work and how research plays a huge role in making AI ethical. Um, I feel like you've given us a both broad and specific view um, and provided us with questions and reference materials. Um, I really appreciate the reframe of the how might we into what happens if we. Um, I feel like that echoes another conversation that came up in the social dilemma um, and in the work of the Center for Humane Technology about the unintended uses of products. Um, I wonder if you could share some of the projects that you're working on now. Oh, sure. Um, one, I'll share a past product that I'm working on because the project I'm currently working on is more of an internal tool currently. Um, so one product that we were exploring uh, was looking at using a couple AI applications in the in a retail space. Um, and something that we wanted to consider were unintended outcomes and really taking a close look at uh, the social side of the socio-technical uh, structure. Um, so a lot of times, maybe almost always, our business goal is, you know, harder, better, faster, stronger, like save money or do something faster. Um, sometimes when we're increasing revenue or decreasing cost, um, we're actually eliminating some sort of social interaction that might be um, invisible um, or not, you know, causally tied, not directly tied to generating revenue, um, but indirectly is a really pivotal part of it. Um, and so something that we were exploring in this kind of retail project um, was what is the difference between using a system to kind of um, monitor a, a retail workspace as opposed to the work that like a manager might be doing when they're kind of walking around the floor and interacting with people. Um, and something really powerful that came up from that um, in terms of kind of cost benefit analysis, but also looking at um, unintended impact. So what, what happens if we um, substitute technology for this interaction essentially, um, is that there is an element of this kind of manager um, and uh, employee interaction um, that's really important for them to understand um, strengths and it ties into their promotion. Um, and that's something that's not necessarily uh, graded for lack of a better word, you know, it's not assessed um, or uh, but it's something that would definitely have an impact if we were just to sub substitute technology for it. So sometimes one of the, actually I didn't put it on here, but one of the initial important questions is just, is technology the right way to solve this? Sometimes you make a model or you make an application that's, you know, really complex and interesting, um, but there might just be a, a simpler, non-technical human way to solve that problem. Yeah, I, I feel like uh, it's very easy to be tech first, um, but maybe there's a conversation or 10 before uh, the problem phase into the deliver phase. Um, do you know, uh, are there folks out there who are building things the right way? That is a tricky question. I think that this, this is what I think about that. I think that one of the challenges of this area is that the way we kind of construct our design and development teams is that we are researching what we're making or what we might make. Um, so it's really tied to engineering work. Um, and we don't necessarily have entire team set up for like design strategy, foresight design, etc. Um, and another challenge in the way we currently construct our work, we meaning like tech companies at large, um, is that we don't necessarily record our failures. So we'll have a lot of research around this is what we did that worked and here's why. But we don't necessarily have the same body of work to say, this is what we did and this is why it didn't work. And these are some of the uh, variables um, or points in that context to consider. So like what, what, what might we learn from a failure in this se sector that we can draw from to determine what might not work in another sector. Um, so in my, in like a dream world, if I was to create like a whole new way of working, um, especially for these kinds of complex technologies, um, is that there would actually be a, a like somewhat rigorous but highly collaborative division um, between 
researchers who are embedded in like product work um, and researchers who are more involved in understanding understanding the, the landscape, so to speak, um, and trying to identify the invisible portions of that socio-technical landscape and make them visible so that we can consider them when determining outcome. Amazing answer, thank you. Um, there's a question in chat from Lamel. Um, can we assume that the system being discussed was not being developed to catch exemplary behavior? No, it wasn't actually. It was for it was for something totally separate. But just when we were looking at um, what might what might be captured, you know, in that retail space, and what are the needs of um, all of the the immediate users, so like primary users and then secondary users, um, we were looking at what else it might be impactful in. Um, but no, it was not like a surveillance or monitoring uh, system. Um, attendees who have questions, you can put them in chat or um, you can um, put them in the Q&A. Helen Maria asks, uh, would you talk more about how you work with designers? Uh, yes, I'd love to talk more about work with designers. Um, so I work really closely with designers and the research scientists as well, actually. Um, and something that we like to do in the beginning with, I'm, I'm going to use both of those roles since I do see them as really complementary, at least in the AI space. Um, one of the first things we like to do is to make sure that our research scientists and our designers as well um, understand the ways in which people work together. So initially, you'll, you might have conversations where people will describe the tasks involved in their work. Um, but what I'm interested in surfacing are the kind of the invisible interactions um, that actually power and make that work go through. So if we're looking at automating um, an entire task flow or portions of a task flow in order to make it go faster, um, what do we need to think about whether in terms of workarounds or maybe social motivations um, that we need to consider and design for? Um, so I. I think one example of that would be um, in a particular environment, um, there was an indication um, that was Im implicit and then kind of uncovered through user interviews um, that people preferred to get directions for material, I'm trying to be kind of intentionally vague, um, to get directions for material from their colleagues rather than a system. Um, and the reason for that was that those conversations um, enabled kind of introductions between people um, and gave them an opportunity to kind of establish expertise, um, which meant that they would then get in, you know, invited or um, to, to future work. So yes, there's probably a faster way to, to do that work, but the impact of removing that, it's kind of similar to the retail example, actually, which is, we see that a lot. So the, the impact of removing that human to human interaction um, would have a negative impact on other task flows, which we're not necessarily designing for. Um, and so to go back to how we work with designers, um, use a lot of models. Um, so how can we, you know, use how can we visually communicate a wide range of qualitative and quantitative data um, in one kind of overview or flow um, that will allow us to understand what are the key impact areas that are that we need to consider? Um, I don't I don't oftentimes get as much into the into UI suggestions. I'm often more just in the exploratory phase of different products. Um, so a long answer to a short question. Thank you. Um, Alexander asks um, if we could reframe the reframing. Um, that's my editorial comment on Alex's question. Um, instead of asking um, uh, what happens if we, um, as designers, would, would we reframe that and say, what might happen if we? Um, in other words, exploring the second and third order consequences of a system. How do you feel about that? That, that would be my dream. I would say realistically for time, we don't do that. Um, typically we don't have like second, third, fourth, et cetera scenarios, um, but that is work that I would like to see happening. And I would like to see that happening on a larger scale. 
um, since I'm just talking about my dream world, I would love if there was like an entire or multiple like think tanks um, that actually did this work and we saw closer collaboration between uh, industry and academia um, or different kinds of, of research institutions. Um, I think that is one of the gaps is that there is a, a really wide range um, of in-depth research coming from you know, research institutions, um, but because much of the work done by uh, industry is of course you know private covered by NDA um, making those connections between principles and practice or kind of theory and practice can be challenging um, I don't have any clever ideas about how that collaboration might work given that a lot of the work is NDA but I think that is one of the things that we would need to think about or like even again kind of bringing that in-house and having um, these you know entire teams of, of design strategy and foresight I would love if CCA uh, starts to help create that more ideal world and those and be the home of those think tanks uh, or uh, the hub of multiple think tanks. Um, Andrea asks, in the framework, um, do you draw a distinction between potential uses of the system that undermine its desired outcomes and potential uses that also may violate existing criminal or civil laws? Do I draw a distinction between potential uses that undermine? Yes. So part of the, at its most basic level, um, going through that, uh, that kind of five point flow, um, something that we do have to identify, you know, before it gets to the, to the build stage even, um, is what are elements of misuse um, that may violate existing criminal or civil laws within our scope of impact. So there could be a range of ways that are out of our scope of impact um, that, you know, might be illegal uses, um, but how can we determine misuse and then put up appropriate safeguards against, for example, data security is just a, a simple example. So data security and misuse um, or de-anonymization or de-identification. Um, the potential uses of a system, uh, sorry, users, potential uses of a system that undermine its desired outcomes. So something on that point is um, kind of secondary users or non-users who are impacted by the system. Um, and that's work that we touch on, but I would love to see it be done again on like a larger, more ongoing scale. Same. Um, what should we do about deep fakes? And for those who are new to the world of deep fakes, can, could you give your perspective on it? Uh, deep fakes are the worst. And I think deep fakes are one of those things where I'm like, why did, why did you build that? Like that, that would have been like a really easy thing um, to not do with clear reasons not to do it. Um, and there's, there's actually, I've read some interesting, although I vigorously disagreed with it, perspectives of research scientists who have done um, not deep fakes specifically, but like technology that's a bit, I'm not into it. Um, and essentially they're saying we're research scientists. Um, our job is to create things that haven't been done before and that are interesting from a research perspective um, and how it gets used is out of our purview. And they're drawing this, this particular writer, um, although this is the sentiment is shared by some folks, um, is drawing what I think is a line that should not be drawn. Um, when you create something, and maybe part of this is an error in our, in our education system or in the ways in which we set up collaboration because yes technically the way that we educate our research scientists and our engineers is that you make the thing and you give it to somebody else to do something with you make a model um, you give it to the product team to do something with what they do with it is not technically a responsibility nor is it something that we necessarily teach um, you know in computer science etc um, and i think as a maybe industry is too broad, but like as an industry and as um, an academic institution or people who are involved in kind of research and teaching, how can we start to think about expanding that sphere of things that we should think about? Um, and what do we need to think more closely about collaboration um, in terms of if, for example, you make a model like deep, like the deep fake model, um, or I think another example is that model that imitates imitates voices. Um, you know, so there's like clips of Obama saying whatever, but it's not Obama. Um, so there's some like clear examples of stuff that's going to be used very negatively. Um, and what kind of 
checks or processes do we have um, about releasing it? I guess it's it's kind of an old argument. Like if you'd invent the nuclear bomb, like should you release nuclear bomb? I'm on team, don't release the nuclear bomb. Like if it has a very easy way to be misused and society was like, okay without it before, like just don't do it. Um, but we don't really have checks or processes as an industry um, for what that flow is. So I feel like I keep coming back to my answer of like, there needs to be internal teams that look at design force and a strategy that can have some sort of power over saying, this is how it could be used poorly. And this is how easily it could be used for negative impact and therefore control alt delete it. Control alt delete, I love it. I mean, I wonder to, to your point, I wonder if there's some like industry wide scale, like the Scoville units for spicy peppers and the most scale for hardness of minerals. Like, could there be an equivalent for the moral crumple zone? Could there be a scale that's like you, we shouldn't go past this point with deep fakes or things I, like that? I feel like the easy answer is yes, but sometimes revenue foils us. So I think some, I think an easy example is, is maybe the, um, the Uber self-driving car. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a wide range of research that we could have drawn from um, about maintaining attention or designing for attention. Um, and I was, I was talking about it with a friend today because she has a Honda. It's not self-driving, but it kind of like semi takes over for you. Um, but it gives you like, uh, I'm forgetting the word, like tactile, like sensory feedbacks when you need to take over. Um, so when it predicts that like, you're not going to go over the I don't even have a driver's license, so I don't know what color the lines are, the white lines on the road. Um, it'll kind of like vibrate and it indicates to you that you need to take control. Um, in an autonomous vehicle, you need even more indicators than that. And you need them to align with human reaction time. Humans react very slowly. Humans are like pretty clumsy and we don't pay attention, you know? So like you need to account for that when you're designing an autonomous system, whether it's a car or any of these other systems that we're talking about. So given our limitations and what we know about our limitations, um, who is responsible for designing systems that allow us to perform our best? Um, and then what does accountability mean in those scenarios? Um, I feel like I'm going off track, but some things to think about. Since there's so much potential for misuse, Nina wonders what makes you the most hopeful about the future of AI technology and its positive usage? Something that makes me hopeful is that there are folks from a range of backgrounds, so like government, um, civic society, non-government groups, et cetera, that are putting out different materials that make this information accessible. Um, so a lot of this technology is complex. Um, and complex things are complex. There's no way to make them you know, simpler, um, but we can make them understandable. And I think the first step in us deciding um, you know, as a society, like what, impacts do we want these products to have? What are we comfortable with? How do we enforce it? Um, is reaching a point of more shared understanding about how some of these complex pieces of technology work and impact us. Um, and so people engaging with different elements of that um, and kind of raising, I guess, I don't wanna use the term tech literacy, but in, in some way like AI literacy on a high level um, starts to enable us to you know, maybe pass better rules and regulations for et cetera. Okay, thank you for that I'm hopeful some, answer. Yeah. I'm seeing some questions and I don't know if I look at the other Q&A. Oh, I got you. Okay. Um, Aaron would like to know um, what your thoughts are about external groups, uh, civil society groups, for example, that use AI to monitor corporate product AI. Can you give me an example? I actually don't think that I am familiar. Yeah, Aaron, if you want to clarify in, in chat or just um, send me a PM in, in chat, um, we, can, we can clarify that. Um, meanwhile, Sasha? I, one example of that, that I don't know if this is what, uh, Aaron, I don't know if this is what you meant, um, but I remember on, I want to say it was Firefox, because Firefox does this pretty well. Um, 
that Firefox had this page a while back, maybe it's still live, where they listed a wide range of AI products, um, you know, like Alexa, for example. Um, and then they had this like rating system for like, this is how much of your data they have access to, and this is what they do with your data. And it was a really consumable, understandable way at a glance to be like, oh, I'm actually not comfortable with, for example, um, two percent of my like Alexa voice memo is being reviewed by like a human reviewer. I don't know what the term is transcript reviewer, um, and that um, better enabled people to understand the extent to which their data was being accessed and shared. Um, I don't know if Mozilla or Firefox is technically as I mean I guess they're enterprise, so they have a strong like civil uh, purpose as well. I guess. Mm -hmm. Erin um, uh, clarified, um, she's working with the Anti-Defamation League and they're building okay. an AI to monitor online hate in social platforms, which are often moderated with AI. Oh, we love, although sometimes it can be challenging to define, to use models to define hate speech, um, but given like the volume of hate speech online, um, I think that would be the best tool like in their toolbox um, to monitor and have an impact on that. Okay, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, Emily asks, do you think a UX researcher has the potential to make more of a difference by going to work for a company which is already focused on designing ethical AI slash tech or by going to work for one that might be considered more mainstream and trying to encourage a stronger focus within that company on the ethical implications of its designs? Okay, I have really strong feelings about this that people might disagree with. I do not think that going to work for a mainstream company um, that you that you I think this question is essentially about change from within. Um, I do not think that we can do that. Uh, there are people in com unless you're rolling into the company as like a CEO or you're on the board. At the end of the day, you have very little impact on that company's direction. Um, and quite frankly, you're interchangeable. Like there are other people that do your role that they would just move in. So if you go, I'm gonna use, well, I'm, I guess I'm not gonna name names. Let's say there's a very large social networking company that has had arguably negative impacts on our democracy. And I had a real conversation with a friend who is a neuroscientist, um, he's his PhD and he went to go work on the AI, his, their AI team. Um, and I was like, sir, how dare you put your talents to use there? Um, and he was saying, well, I can change it from within. And I just do not, there's no way to do that. Um, there are there are people who are much have much more power um, and experience than than us, you know, at, at this level have tried. Um, and they have left, you know, after six months, they've written some really great, I think it was in the Washington Post, um, basically being like, this, it's not possible to change. Um, if a company's revenue model is intrinsically tied to unethical behavior, then you won't be able to have an impact there. So I, I guess it, it depends on the severity of their lack of ethics, um, but I, I guess a summary of it would be, yeah, if it's tied to being unethical, we can't impact it. I think I know the company and the person you might be referring to, <laughs> possibly. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Sasha asks, what would you prioritize after accountability? And I think that will be our last question. Uh, I don't know if I would prioritize it, but I think explainability um, is really important. Um, models are complex um, and they're using a wide range of data and making a wide range of decisions in order to deliver an outcome or an output. Um, and so explainability of that portion um, becomes really important, maybe to identify bias, um, to identify when we might need to take over for a system or make a different decision, et cetera. Okay. Um, thank you, Hannah, so much for your time and your, your wise uh, guidance. It's really lovely to hear more about your work um, and your, your take on ethical AI. Um, thank you attendees and participants and question and answerers. Um, thank you everyone for being here tonight. Thanks everyone. Um, if everyone could uh, give a last clap moment. Yes, this is the best part. <laughs> <laughs> thank you again. It's, it's been an amazing insightful evening. Thank you. Bye everyone. <laughs>